Hi, it's Mr. Anderson. In this podcast, I'm going to talk about the molecules of life. It, the first time I learned this, I was pretty amazed. But basically, the way the world works is that we eat food, and then the building blocks of that food we weave together make to make living things. And so this right here is called a Dave Thomas. Dave Thomas is the founder of Wendy's. But Dave Thomas and his body was made up of building blocks that came from the food that he created. In other words, the proteins in the burger are broken down into amino acids and those make the proteins in him. Or the sugars in the carbohydrates of the bun are broken down to make sugars that is used in cellular respiration to make ATP to move the materials inside him. Or the fat inside the burger is used to make the lipids inside the cell membranes of a Dave Thomas. He's actually a really fascinating guy when I read about him a little bit. Didn't know this, but he worked for Colonel Sanders in KFC. So it's worth studying the Wikipedia a little bit on Dave Thomas. Also a war hero. So cool. But basically, um, life is built on carbon. And the reason life is built on carbon is that carbon has four valence electrons. In other words, it has six protons. That means it has six electrons and two electrons in the first level, but it has one electron in each of these. If you were to draw a Lewis dot diagram, one of these in each of those uh, outer valence shells. And so basically, it's really good at bonding. And so the reason life is made up of carbon is because it fairly, makes fairly stable, large carbon-based molecules. And that's what we are. Uh, if it weren't carbon, then maybe it would be silicon, which sits right below this. I remember watching a Star Trek episode way back in the day where there were these giant uh, rock animals called the Horta. And basically this right here is Spock mind melding with a Horta. Uh, but based in silicon. And so if we were to find life somewhere out there in the planet, maybe silica would be an example of that. And my computer is made up of silica, which is about as close to life as we have on our planet. So the first thing you should understand is the idea of what a functional group is. So life is made up of carbon, these huge carbon chains. That's what DNA is pretty much made up of, carbon and hydrogen. But there are things around the outside of it that are called functional groups. And those give functionality. They give um, behavior to the chemicals. And so if we go through these, starting with the first one, this would be a carboxyl group. There's going to be a carbon right here at the middle. And so we could abbreviate a carboxyl group by just writing COOH. But basically a carboxyl group is going to donate this hydrogen ion. And so it will make things that are carboxylic acid. This carboxyl group and the amino group actually form amino acids. Uh, next one would be the carbonyl group. Uh, carbonyl group has a carbon right here. If it's in the middle, we call it a ketone. At the end, it's called an aldehyde. So formaldehyde would be an example of that. Uh, this would be a methyl group. A methyl group is going to be a carbon with three hydrogens around the outside of it. Methyl groups would be important in methylation. So basically what they can do, DNA would be a greater example of that, is they can methylate organ, uh, uh, these big carbon compounds, make them uh, non-functional. Amino group would be another one. The amino group is going to have an NH2, so it's got nitrogen. And we need nitrogen to survive. And the reason we need nitrogen is to make amino acids. And then basically an amino acid, which is the building block of protein, are made up of carboxyl group and amino group. Uh, next one would be the phosphate. Phosphate, you, you may know this, it's actually what's on the end of ATP. It's what we use for energy transfer. Uh, also, it's used to build DNA, for example. So transfer of energy would be a phosphate group. And then finally, we have the hydroxyl group. Hydroxyl group is going to be an OH. Uh, what that does is make it polar, and so it makes it readily dissolvable. And so if you learn these six in biology, just what they are, that you're going to see, even in this presentation, that they're going to start showing up. And you can predict some of the properties. So amino groups will don't, it'll grab onto a hydrogen ion, become bases. Um, and so there's a lot of things you can learn from functional groups, but the first thing you want to do is simply memorize them. Now we get to the actual molecules of life, which are mostly polymers. Now know this, that the polymers are made up of monomers. And so monomers are the building blocks, and polymers are these large macro molecules. And there's only four in biology that you have to learn, so it's pretty easy. But those polymers are built through a process called dehydration. So if we look right here, this is one amino acid, and this is another amino acid. You can see right here again that there's an amino group on this side, there's a carboxyl group on that side, but basically if we look right here in the middle, if we have two amino acids right next to each other, if I were to remove just this section right here, it's an oxygen and two hydrogens, what am I removing? I'm removing H2O, and that's called water. And so we call that a dehydration reaction because you're removing water, just like when you're dehydrated, you're 
you don't have enough water. So you remove that water and we form a covalent bond in the middle. That would be a peptide bond. And so the proteins inside my hair and my nails and my skin and all of that is made up of amino acids that are attached together. Each time we attach two amino acids, we got to lose a water. Likewise, if we want to break it apart. So let's say I eat a burger, one of those Wendy's burgers, and I want to break down the proteins and then make amino acids out of it um, that I can use inside my body. What would be the reaction there? That's called hydrolysis. So hydrolysis now is hydro water. Lysis means to break, and so we're adding a water here in the middle, and we're breaking that bond apart, and so now we have two amino acids. And so how do you build proteins? Through dehydration reaction. How do you break them down? Hydrolysis. How do you build nucleic acids like DNA? Dehydration reaction. How do you break it down? You're going to do that through hydrolysis. And so even carbohydrates, same way. And so let's get to those four major macromolecules. The first one is going to be called nucleic acids. Nucleic acids, the two big ones you should understand are RNA and DNA. DNA stores information inside the cell. RNA is kind of a slave to the DNA, but it does work. So these right here would be polymers, large macromolecules. What are the building blocks? It's going to be these nucleotides. And so this would be a nucleotide that builds, this would be one that builds DNA. So it's got a base, a sugar, and a phosphate. And so we simply attach these over and over and over again. And so it would fit right in here. And that would be one nucleotide. So we attach them over and over and over again. Again, we do that through a dehydration reaction. And eventually you have DNA. So where do we get our DNA? We eat our food and we break it down into monomers. And then we can weave that back into the stuff of life. If we go to proteins, proteins, again, are made up of amino acids. Again, here's that amino group. Right here would be the carboxyl group. Right here in the middle of an amino acid, we have a carbon and a hydrogen. And then on the side, we have a R or a side chain. And so basically, this is going to be different in every amino acid. And so just like we have 26 letters that make all the words in our alphabet, there are only 20 amino acids that humans need to survive. And these are all 20 amino acids. And if you look at them, don't memorize them. That'd be silly. But if you look at them, what you'll see is here it is. Here's our carboxyl group, our amino group. And all of them have carboxyl amino, carboxyl amino. But if you look on the side, this R or side chain is going to be different in every amino acid. So this would be one side chain. That'd be another side chain that'd be another side chain. And we have a few properties. So like these ones would all be positive. These ones would be negative. These ones right here would be uncharged. So they're, excuse me, charged. And you can see like here's a hydroxyl group, here's a hydroxyl group, here's an amino and amino group. And so that's why they're charged. And so basically what is a protein? A protein is this huge three-dimensional structure that's made up of sometimes thousands of amino acids attached together. And so why do they look the way they do? Well, the order of them is important and DNA holds that. But once you have all those amino acids attached together, it'll basically look like this where you have all the backbone, but on the side you're going to have all your R or side chains. And so basically once you build a polypeptide or a protein, it's then going to fold into a characteristic shape like this. Why is it going to do that? Well, first of all, they're going to be all these alpha helices, and basically those are built on hydrogen bonds. Then all the polar, polar side chains will fold to the outside of the protein. All the nonpolar will hide in the middle. You'll have positive attached to negative, and sometimes we refer to this all as the tertiary structure. And then the quaternary structure would be you know, having more than one polypeptide attached together. But when you look at me, you're looking at proteins, and that proteins are all built of these monomers, which are amino acids. Next one then would be the lipids. Lipids basically, there's one thing that ties those all together. There are a carbon, 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 and then hydrogen around the outside. So we call these things hydrocarbons. And so this would be a fatty acid, but this would be like a triglyceride. It makes that burger, that fatness of the burger really good. This would be a phospholipid. And that would be inside the membranes of all living material or cholesterol. You can see that hydrocarbon chain right here. These things are used for energy, um, but they also build up membranes. One more important thing about them is that they come in two different types, saturated and unsaturated. Basically, if you're saturated, it means you're straight because you have hydrogen around the whole thing. If you're unsaturated, you have a double band, a bond in the middle. And so things like fat, uh, like butter, uh, animal fat are going to be saturated. Unsaturated things would be like an olive oil because if they're bent, they can't quite get next to each other and so they form a liquid at room temperature. Um, we can make them saturated by bubbling hydrogen through it and transforming that fat. So you've maybe heard of trans fats. And then the last one is going to be carbohydrates. Carbohydrates actually come in three different types. We have monosaccharides. 
The quintessential example is glucose. We have disaccharides. An example of that would be sucrose. And then we have these huge polysaccharides, which are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of glucose molecules attached together, or saccharides, sugar molecules attached together. Um, so basically, when you're eating a potato, or when you're eating bread, or when you're eating anything that has starch, it is a bunch of sugar molecules. So there's one, another, another, another. And so they're all attached together using covalent bonds. And so if I want to break down carbohydrates, what do I do? Well, I have to snip that off, hydrolysis, break those into sugars, and then I can use them in cellular respiration. And so those are the molecules of life. Again, there's only four of them. But if you think back to that burger and how that burger eventually becomes you, it's a pretty cool process. And I hope that's helpful.